usually for the uninitiated, you know, my motto is waking up America, one zombie at a time. <laughs> but you guys, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, so I'm going to really start skipping through some stuff. Sorry if I if I go too fast. A lot of this stuff you already know, and a lot of it you know. First of all, why should we be concerned about 9-11? It's all over done with, right? I mean, you know, we've killed a ton of Laden, so they say. And, uh, you know, what, what the heck? Who cares? Well, only because everything that's happened over the past decade and everything that's going on today traces back to 9-11. If 9-11 was funny, if it was a sham, then everything we've been operating under is a sham. Right. And I'm here to tell you, it's a sham. Yeah. All right, well, i got a lot to say about Syria, but I'll wait a little bit. All right, let's move right along here. Um, war in Afghanistan. That's, there you go. Why are we going to Afghanistan? Get Osama bin Laden. Why are we go after Osama bin Laden? Because, hey, he was behind 9-11. That's what they told us. War in Iraq. You're just now finally kind of disengaging from Iraq after millions are killed. A lot of our guys, five, 6,000 or whatever, you know, and there's a whole story there. But again, it comes back to 9-11. Uh, <laughs> the least said about our curtailed liberties, the better, right? Look what's going on now. I, I can't stand it. It's a, Obama says, I'm going to go and bomb uh, the, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, by the way. Who says, uh, yeah, I'm going to go bomb Syria because I don't like what they're doing. You know, we, we, we go kill people who kill people because killing's bad. Uh, what? We want peace. And if you don't want peace, we'll bomb the hell out of it. Okay? And it's incredible. And yet we don't seem to remember anything. Doesn't anybody besides me remember light at the end of the tunnel in Vietnam? Doesn't anybody besides me remember the babies thrown from the incubators in Kuwait? Does anybody besides me remember weapons of mass destruction? You know, come on, folks. George W. Bush couldn't get it right, but I can. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me for buying into this idiocy. And here we are. All right. And it all starts with 9-11. All right, first off, you realize the official... I mean, everybody claims I'm like, you know, if you read uh, the Dallas Observer, you'll find out I'm a nut and a conspiracy theorist, right? Well, let me tell you something. The worst conspiracy theory I ever heard in my life is that 19 crazed Muslim hijackers hijacked four separate airliners using little big box loaders, and I mean, they flew them into these buildings, knocking down, you know, two and, and, and damaging the Pentagon, and then a third building that wasn't even hit by airplanes. And, and bypassing and, and, and uh, overcoming our $40 billion uh, defense system, all under the control of a Muslim cleric using a laptop computer in a cave in Afghanistan. Now, if that is the most ridiculous conspiracy theory I ever heard, but that's what we're expected to believe. First off, seven of these named hijackers, as you all are probably well aware, have turned up alive. It's not even the ones they named. And these were people, one of them I recall was an uh, airline pilot from Saudi Arabia who said his passport was stolen while he was uh, in a layover in Denver, Colorado, okay? So who are these guys? We don't know, who knows, but we're told, and they're still on, even though these seven have come forward with the support of the Saudi foreign minister and said, well, it wasn't us, here I am, I'm still here and I'm still alive. The FBI still says those are the people. Okay, this I think is the tip off. Uh, Abu Zabidah was like uh, in the summer of 2002, was caught in uh, Pakistan, and Ari, uh, I mean, uh, the White House uh, press secretary under Bush, uh, you know, made a big deal about this and said, We've caught the third highest ranking Al Qaeda guy, and we're, we're going to make him talk. Well, if you follow this story, it's pretty interesting because, yeah, he did talk, but not the way they wanted. Did they waterboard him? Yes. Did they torture him? Yes. Did they talk? No. What they finally did was tricky, okay? They got a couple of uh, U.S. Special Forces guys of Arab uh, descent to dress up like uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Arabian 
interrogators and they flew a lot, flew around for a while, told him they were landing in Saudi Arabia and that they were turning him over to the Saudis for interrogation. Now this was supposed to scare the hell out of him and he was going to talk, see? Well, when they came in to the little room where he was, he wasn't fearful. He was glad to see him. He's going like that, you guys are here. Because he had been fessed up and said that he was actually operating under the orders of these three Saudi princes. And their cutout, middleman, was Air Marshal Mir of Pakistan. Now, I ask you, who were the close business and social friends of the Saudi royals? The Bushes. The Bushes. Now, this is pretty telling stuff. And in fact, within a couple of months, all three Saudi princes and Air Marshal Mir were dead. Killed in a car crash, plane crash, you know. And the one I liked was one of the Saudi princes, they said, died of dehydration. <laughs> Excuse me, I thought those Arabs were supposed to know how to handle themselves in the desert, you know. So here you go. Now we see that the Al-Qaeda was actually in control of the Saudis. If you read my book, The Rise of the Fourth Reich, you'll find out that the Al-Qaeda is simply another name for the Muslim Brotherhood, which was turned over to the CIA by the British at the end of World War II. So we've been running Al-Qaeda ever since we brought Osama bin Laden to this country under the name Tim Osman and armed him and, and trained him and sent him back uh, to, Af to Afghanistan to fight the Russians at that time, okay? Whatever. Come on. You get the wrong thing. No, there we go. Now, you may not know about this. Russ Wittenberg, oh, no, no, no. NORAD successfully scrambled interceptors within 15 minutes of alert. Everybody remember the golfer Peyton Stewart? Yep. And his, they, they had a malfunction and the, and the air went out of his airplane and it went off course. And then I think about 12 minutes they had interceptors up flying all alongside of him, okay? And they were prepared to shoot him down, except he finally ran out of gas over an uninhabited area. You know, it was really tragic. But that shows how quickly they can respond when they want to. Uh, 67 times between September 2000 and June 2001, yet on September 11th, they failed to accomplish this practice test four times in one day. Yeah. Now that should tell anybody there's something funky going on. Russ Wittenberg flew, it was a, a fighter pilot from Vietnam and then flew commercial airliners and actually flew a couple of the airplanes that they said were in use on 9-11. He said they ex exceeded their design specifications. What does that tell you? I'll tell you what it tells me. They were under computer remote control. Now this is something very, very important to understand. In 2001, nobody knew about Global Hawk, except me. In the summer of uh, 2001, a Boeing 737 took off from Edwards Air Force Base, flew to Australia, flew 12 missions, and flew back and landed safely all the while with no one on board. It was all under remote control. I knew this because in the 80s I was interviewing a airline pilot. He groused to me off camera. He said, you know, my knock job's just redundant. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm just there uh, in case the computer fails because the computer runs the airplane. Okay, so uh, if you've ever had experience with the CB radio, if your signal is stronger than your CB radio, it steps on it or it overpowers it. And they can do this with airliners that are on computer wire control. Okay? And I knew this, and so when I heard that they exceeded, exceeded their design specifications, I said, that's impossible unless it's been captured electronically. The second tip-off is that all four of these hijackings that were supposedly separate hijackings from separate airports their transponders went off at about the same time. That's impossible unless the ground capture captured them all at the same time. Now, through this whole presentation, I'm not going to theorize. I'm not going to tell you what I think happened or, or who I think behind it or how they made it work. I'm giving you facts. Now, I want you to carefully look at this picture of one of the towers being built. Look at, the, look at the steel columns in the center of this thing, all interconnected. They said, well, they were just they were just bolted together and it all came in and popped all the bolts. Now, uh -uh, they were welded and we know this. So in other words, when those towers collapsed, 
That's like the records on your record player. They all come down, but that spindle should be still standing there. But it wasn't. It disappeared. In fact, you know, you should have had 10 stories high worth of debris, but you didn't. You had two. What happened to the rest of them? What happened to the toilets? What happened to the filing cabinets? Disintegration. Also, they, they are messing with you because here is the diagram they showed you from the 9-11 Commission Report, and they talked about the pancake effect. And each of these floors just collapsed and knocked the one down next to it. What they don't tell you is, is that this diagram represents only from here to here, not from here to here. So they're messing with you. We told the fires were so intense it just melted the plane, but look at this blow up. You see people standing in the hole. They're still alive, everything's okay. The whole thing's a farce from where it go. Uh, this is the, uh, the Windsor Hotel in Madrid, Spain. It burned out of control for two full days. And yet you notice it didn't collapse. No modern building made with steel, steel uh, structure has ever collapsed in the history of the world. Now, let's take a look at the Twin Towers, though. Again, you know, you should have 10 stories of debris. You got less than two. And there it all is, just lying here. And again, you can find me a toilet in there. And I guarantee you, you're trying to destroy a top car of toilet, you've got to work ahead of it. All right, now this is looking at Building 7 from the debris of the uh, World Trade Center. And World Trade Center 7, as I'm sure you all are aware, that's, that's the linchpin, that's the smoking gun. Yeah. This 47 stories houses the offices of the Security Exchange Commission, which has now admitted that Osa and G. Turbo, they lost all of their prosecution files for Enron, World.com. And by the way, I understand that even the prosecution records against uh, Prescott Bush dating back to World War II when in November of 1942 was prosecuted by the federal government for being nothing but a financial front man for Hitler and the Nazis. Oh, look, it just kind of kind of toppled down. Boom, okay, yeah. Right, well, it, you know, I had a fire or two and it, and it just fell down. You know, we all know that. You all know all this. How ridiculous. And you know about Larry Silverstein. He said, let's pull it. Okay. Now, check out Building 7 nestled very neatly between the Verizon building and the U.S. Post Office. And uh, look, no significant damage to these two buildings. It just, it just imploded and went right down on itself. And look how the walls are all caving in like that. that that's an implosion. Okay. And of course you know about ABC, they announced that Building 7 had collapsed 25 minutes before it did. Uh, and by the way, uh, you may have missed this story here, Just this brings us right up to date. There's a fellow in England who refused to pay his television tax. Okay, it's like, you, so you're on cable or satellite, you have to pay the company, right? Well, over there they pay the government because they're on it. So he refused to pay his TV tax, he said, because the BBC had lied to him about 9-11. Well, they took him to court. And are you ready for this? The court, uh, the judge, looked at this clip of them announcing beforehand the building collapse and other evidence and ruled in his favor. <laughs> he said, yes, the government lied to you. You don't have to pay your tax. All right, now this is, uh, what, what caused this giant hole in building six? All right? And by the way, you don't really see it, but under this huge hole is about a 50-foot deep crater. Something blew up in Building 6, all right? Blew up. That's not debris falling on the building. It would have piled up, right? And here, by the way, is a really neat picture because where you see the arrow, that's Building 6. Notice how it's blasted and black. It's already been hit with something. Something's devastated that building, and yet, the South Tower, which collapsed first, is collapsing in the background. And the North Tower, which you can see right here, is still okay and standing. So what hit Building 6? The whole thing stinks to high heaven. And now you already know about this too, about all the debris, heavy steel girders thrown out hundreds of feet. And notice the uh, pyroclastic cloud uh, that appears with the uh, explosion of the World Trade Center 
and notice the stuff going up. <laughs> Excuse me. How do you get a building that's just collapsing, exploding upwards? Molten steel, you already know about that. You're going to get molten steel with the building collapsing. And what scorched all these cars? They were in parking lots, blocks away, even out on the uh, FDR freeway. Something scorched them. What flipped this car upside down? How does the building collapsing flip a car upside down? What knocked these parking meters over? He's, they said there was about uh, at least eight of these, and this is over on Barclay Street, and they were all leaning over, and their faces are all burned and scorched. How does a building falling down cause that? And here's the clincher. What causes a steel girder to disintegrate in midair? This thing did not fall over, it disintegrated. Now I can tell you about a particle beam accelerator that they were trying to perfect it at Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island, which is only about 25 miles away. And which, by the way, was the device that brought down the TWA 800. But that's another story. Again, the pyroclastic cloud. And notice the similarity to a nuclear blast in the desert. But here's the clincher. I want to take a minute for this because as sad as it is to say, at the, the bottom line of 9-11 apparently was an insurance scam. The Port Authority of New York owned the World Trade Centers. They were sitting on Rockefeller land. The people in New York never were enamored of them. They called them the David and the Nelson. And they thought they broke up their wonderful skyline. Uh, so they never were happy with them, and they never were profitable. They were mostly empty on 9-11. Whole floors with no tenants. All right? There is evidence that they had secret talks about how what to do with this monstrosity because 30 years had gone by since they were built and they were beginning to deteriorate, okay? So the first plan was, well, let's just demolish them. But then they found out the city wouldn't give them a permit because they were half filled with asbestos. All right, so they can't turn them down. So then they did another secret study to see if they could refurbish them. But you can imagine what it would cost to put scaffolding up 110 stories. So they went, well, that's not really going to work either. So I ask you, what does the mafia do if they got a building and they can't renovate it, they can't demolish it, they can't rent it? They torch it for the insurance, right? So just two months before 9-11, uh, Silverstein Properties and Wakefield Properties uh, takes a 99-year lease on the World Trade Center buildings for $3.2 billion. But they don't have to pay all that right away. In fact, all they did was pay down about $125 million. And I forget now whether that was like a down payment or maybe it was like a few payments in advance. So now they've got 125 million in it. Silverstein, one well, of the first thing he does is he goes and hires a company called Securicom to provide security for the World Trade Center. Well, Securicom just happened to be uh, a Bush-dominated company because the uh, CEO was Work Walker III, as in George Herbert Walker Bush, close friends, and his younger brother, uh, Marvin Bush, was a director. So now the Bushes have control over the security of the World Trade Center as well as Dulles Airport and United Airlines. You didn't have to be. All right, the next thing Silverstein does is go and get insurance on the World Trade Centers. All right, and he demands and gets a clause that says they will pay out if there's a terrorist attack. Well, I defy you to go see if you can get State Farm to give you insurance on their house <laughs> against a terrorist attack, okay? They don't do it because they can't qualify. But he got it, and here's the tip-off. He didn't go to State Farm, okay, or Liberty Mutual. No, these insurance companies were Alliance, the giant Nazi, the German insurance company, which during World War II indemnified concentration camps against damage by their inmates. Oh and uh, Swiss Re and a couple of those giant uh, world-class insurance companies. Well, now we're talking about the Bilderbergs, right? We're talking about the royalty of Europe. Now, you, at that level, you got to understand that's where the money was. All right, and then after getting all this set up and after uh, several weekends of uh, drills, 
and uh, and uh, operations during the middle of the night when trucks were coming and going, uh, God knows when what. Then all of a sudden we got 9/11 and planes come in, the buildings go down. Okay, and service time goes to court and says, well, they, two planes hit two buildings. I want double indemnity. You know, he's trying to get 16 billion dollars or something like that. Well, they argue around for about a year, and finally they said, okay, and he accepts uh, 4.6 billion dollars for a hundred and twenty five million dollar investment not bad and to top it off the port authority i guess they felt sorry for him losing his investment they refunded his hundred twenty five million dollars all right that's a lot of money but now please understand that, that he doesn't get to keep all that money silverstein does he had to split it with the mortgage holder. And the mortgage holder was Blackstone Group, who was headed by, I'm sure, sheer coincidence, Peter G. Peterson, chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. All right? This is where 9-11 took place. This is where the money went. And this is why you're never going to hear the straight of it. So now let's look at the Pentagon. You know about that. But uh, notice the walls of the Pentagon here are bulged out. <coughs> something didn't hit it and go in. Something blew it from inside out. If you'll read my book, The Terror Conspiracy, there's a great appendix back here by Barbara Honiger, who still works as a, a military reporter and has access to people in the Pentagon, ranking generals and politicians, etc. And she will prove to you that the explosions that took place in the Pentagon were internal. Did something hit the Pentagon? Apparently so. But it suddenly won a 757. Here is the picture you never see. This is a picture of the hole in the Pentagon before the wall collapsed. You notice the paint's so good on this side of the car, and you notice the hole is only one story high, and about, about 18 to 20 foot wide. You notice there's still windows in here, and still glass here, glass here. Got a few desultory fires going. Okay, wait a minute. How can a 757 with a wingspan of 125 feet and a tail, 44 feet, that's four stories, how does it hit this Pentagon and go through a little bitty hole right there? Well, it can't. And by the way, let's just use our common sense. Come on, we all know that these big super jets, they've got those two big, huge jet engines, okay? And they've got, they've got steel blades. I mean, those things, they weigh more than two tons each. That's four tons of engine, and they're huge. Now, all right, this thing comes in, it hits the Pentagon. I say only one of two things is gonna happen. One, the most likely, is that since everything on the airplane is based on uh, weight, and they're mostly flying beer cans. They're just aluminum, you know, in a frame. Those two huge two-ton jet engines are going to break off and lay there in front of the building. But they weren't there. So the only other possibility is, is that, okay, maybe it had enough velocity that it poked two big holes in the side of the Pentagon. But it didn't do that either, did it? This is total lies that we're being told. Here's what an airplane crash looks like, and I know because I was a police reporter and an aviation aerospace rider and won awards. I've been to plane crashes, lots of them, and they're a mess. Usually the only thing that's intact is the tail, because the tail breaks off. And if, the, if this thing had hit 757 and hit the Pentagon, the tail would have broken off and it would have been lying there. But look, oh, it's not there. In fact, there's nothing there. Just a little bit of fire, a little smoke, and some black on the, on the exterior of the building. We got this picture then. This is one of their screw ups. If you'll think back, and of course our collective memory seems to be about 15 minutes, but if you'll think back, the initial report said the plane hit the ground and ricocheted into the building. All right? Well, then what they didn't realize was that there were these firemen who were already out on a call, and then they heard that something hit the Pentagon, so they rushed immediately to the Pentagon, and they were in there within a few minutes and started taking snapshots with their personal cameras and before the day was out these pictures were appearing on the on the internet so oops look there's nothing on the ground and the grass is still green everything's okay it didn't hit the ground 
So they, they actually had to change their story and say, oh, okay, it, it didn't ricochet in the building. It, it just came in real low and, 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 and it punched a little bitty hole and, and the wings folded up and the tails folded up and there's like a torpedo and it just burned its way in there and then blew up and went. And it was so hot it just burned everything up. It burned up the plane. It burned up the engines. It burned up the jet. It, it burned up the titanium steel blades. It, it burned up the wheel assemblies. Yeah, oh, and we, but, but it killed all those passengers, we know, because we got their fingerprints. <laughs> God, they expect us to believe anything. Why not? Now, look at this. Here's the pulse up. Look how plain the walls are on the inside. Um, here's a little stand with a book, probably this big thick book, it's probably a dictionary, sitting on top of it. Here's a wooden desk. Here's a computer model, a monitor. You know, that's okay. It was a big fire. Didn't but what we, what we, all we saw was this. Oh, big gaping hole. Got, that's got to be where the airplane hit. But that's not right. I interviewed a fellow named Mauro Chavez, who was with the North, uh, North, uh, North American Air Defense. And he said they were running exercises. Now, I had all this information in 2001, okay? And I proposition my publisher, Harper Collins, that's owned by Rudy O'Carvacher. Let's do a book. Something stinks here. No, they weren't interested. Got to be the spring of 2002, and all of a sudden, some FBI people like uh, Ms. Riley, uh, some of the CIA people were coming forward saying, hey, we knew this was going to happen, and nothing was done. In fact, they blocked us when we tried to investigate Al Qaeda and Osama. You know, so all of a sudden, Harper Collins got interested again. So by the fall of 2002, I had most of this in a book that I was calling the War on Freedom. All right, and they got a contract. They paid me some advance money, and bingo, I got it knocked right out there. And it should have been in publication by early 2003. And I maintain that if it had ever gotten out and gotten widespread publicity and people were aware of all this information, there may not have been the support to invade Iraq. And we could have done without all of that. But no, Harper Collins at the last minute, after they already had advanced copies sold, already had it set in time, had it ready to go, said, no, we got to cancel this book. And I said, why? And the only thing they ever came up with was they didn't want to cause trouble for them. Survivors, families. Oh. Wait a minute, those are the very people trying to find out what's going on. Now, if any of you have any experience with publishing, you know that if you get an advance on a book and then for some reason legal or whatever, or it's just bad, it's wrong, that and they can't publish the book, and you have to repay the advance, right? They paid me the rest of the advance and gave me my rights back and just said, here, go away. Sheer censorship. So that's my, this book didn't get out until 2006. And this is the new, make sure you get the Terror Conspiracy revisited. It's got everything there. Moving along. All right, you know about the war game, so I'm going to skip through this. If you'll think back, though, for about a year, they kept maintaining, well, no, there weren't any war games. Sergeant Savez said they had machine guns on top of the headquarters and that he had never seen such tight security for a military war game exercise. And he said they were there in the headquarters and they were uh, working these war games exercises when it came on uh, CNN that the North Tower had been hit and they were all standing there like most of us <coughs> and saw the plane hit the South Tower. And they were just a god. It's like, how can this be happening? Why? This is the very thing we're diagramming here on this war game exercise. And if you recall, when they called the uh, NORAD, said you've got the interceptors in the air. First response was, is this the real world or is this the exercise? That's how they confounded our, our uh, thing. And yet now we also know that uh, on the 10th of September, the uh, NSA intercepted a message from Mohana Ada who said the match is about to begin tomorrow is zero hour. The match. He didn't say the mission or the op. He said the match, the games. They knew it. Who tipped them off? Who told them we were doing having these military exercises? Nobody could have known except people on the inside. 
And of course, how does the great, much vaunted 9 11 omission or commission report handle all this? It doesn't. How do they, how do they explain Building 7? They didn't even mention it. How's that for an investigation? And here's the one that really gets me. Originally, you know, the day after Pearl Harbor, Congress convened a panel to investigate what happened. Less than a week after the Kennedy assassination, Lyndon Johnson put together that Warren Commission to tell us what had happened. Two years went by and George W. Bush was still dragging his feet, except the, the survivors or their families, the victims' families, demanded that he do something. So he pointed up $3 million for investigation. Well, of course, to you and I, $3 million would be a lot of money, but in Washington, that's, that's pocket change. And even the commission said, we can't operate on $3 million. So by the end of it, he finally had spent $13 million on this investigation of the worst terrorist attack in American history. In 2004, upon his re-election, according to the Republican National Committee, they spent $60 million on his inauguration festivities. So he'll party for $60 million, but he's only going to spend thirteen million to find out what happened to all those 3,000 Americans and put us in this war situation. You know, the war on terror. If y'all ever thought about this, terror is not an enemy. Terror is a tactic. Okay? And anybody can use terror. This would be like the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor, so we declare war on naval aviation. <laughs> so now we know all of this stuff. You know, who, who allowed the Bin Ladens to fly? Right. You when know, all of us were, you know, in a no-fly zone. By the way, you, if you'll read my book, you'll find out that it was Osama bin Laden's older brother, Salim bin Laden, that put up the money to put George W. Bush in the oil business. Come on, there's so much you don't know. Now, all right, everybody listen up. If you miss anything, I want you to catch this next two bits. Because this is what you need to go out and tell your neighbors. John Farmer, former Attorney General of New Jersey, okay? He is not a conspiracy. Yeah, he's not a writer, he's not an author, he was the senior counsel to the official 9-11 commission. And in 2009 he published a book called Ground Truth, and in there he publicly he stated that the 9-11 commission staff discovered that the official version of what had occurred, that is, the government and what the government military officials had told Congress Commission media and the public about who knew what when was almost entirely and inexplicably untrue. And the next page he says, at some level of the government, at some point in time, there was an agreement not to tell the truth about what happened. So when somebody says 9-11, 9-11 truth, hey, what's the matter with you? Aren't you patriotic? Say, hey, the head of the, the chief lawyer of the 9-11 Commission said the story they gave us is untrue. What is unpatriotic about asking for the truth? Right. All right. Yeah. Now, what, what do we know about 9-11? Well, uh, hey, I know about 9-11. Well, it was 19 craziest hijackers using box cutters, and they, and they captured four airliners, and they were smashing in those buildings, and one of them was overtaken by the passengers. How do we know this? None of you know this. You weren't there. I don't know that. I wasn't there. All right? How do we know this? You know why? Because really it all comes back to there were these phone calls. But the phone calls usually went to third parties, and there was really none that was actually direct phone calls, none that were recorded, none that we ever actually heard. We just heard from people who said they heard this, and the key one, of course, was Barbara Olson, who was uh, a CNN commentator. And her husband, Ted Olson, who was Solicitor General of the United States, appointed by George W. Bush, said he had gotten several phone calls from his wife, and she was on this flight, and it was captured, and that they had heard it, the passengers and the flight crew, to the rear of the plane, and they were using little uh, uh, knives, and cardboard cutters, which got translated into box cutters, okay? And that's, that's it. 
Okay, now the problems began immediately because the person was pointed out that in 2001 you could not use a cell phone to make a phone call from a high flying jet. So Ted Olson backpedaled and said, well, obviously she used the telephone in the back seat of the airplane, one of those radio telephones. But then they checked and found out the flight she was on did not have the back seat telephone. <laughs> So he's kind of stuck with that, and then he said he got three or four calls, and finally he said, well, it's actually it's only two. And then the clincher came in 2006 with the trial of Zachariah, Missouri, uh, who was an admitted member of Al-Qaeda, but he was already under arrest on 9-11, so he didn't have anything directly to do with 9-11. But the FBI came into court ready to prosecute him like mad, and as they want to do, they brought in all these details and all this evidence, including transcripts and, and, and the, the data for all the phone calls made that morning. And guess what? It turns out there was only one attempted call by Barbara Olson, and according to the FBI, it was unconnected. In other words, folks, there was no call from Barbara Olson. So everything you think you know and everything your neighbors and your friends and the other people in Dallas and North Texas and the United States, everything we think we know about 9 11 is just a total fraud based on nothing. And I'm sure you're well aware of all of the residue of thermite that was found in the World Trade Center. And that was widely publicized in Europe. It's a peer reviewed scientific document, and yet here you don't even hear about it. Now, in 2008, we finally got to swap. Bush's National Socialism, because that's what it was, with all the socialism going to the corporations, for Obama's now, Marxist Socialism. <laughs> what they pulled on us is the old used car salesman's trick. You want to go downtown, you're going to buy a bicycle, but you get hooked up to this used car salesman, he says, come on in. He says, hey, do you like the green one? You know, or do you like the red one? Ribbon. Oh man, that's a chick magnet. You know, you can get a date if you get that car, but now the green one, it gets better gas mileage. Which one do you really like? And you go, well, I guess I really better go for the thing that saves gas. Yeah, the green one here, come on in right here, we'll sign the paper. And you're walking off reasonably happy until you stop and think, wait a minute, I don't want to buy a car anyway, I want to buy some. <laughs> we don't want socialism, but we're getting it anyway. Because, hey, do you want the National Socialism or Marxist Socialism? And if you go back and look, you'll find that the same people behind all of the administration uh, from 89 to 93, uh, except for Dan Quayle who can't spell the title, and James Baker and Louis Sullivan uh, Health and Human Services, everyone was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, the Clinton administration, everybody except William Perry, Council on Foreign Relations. And then we get another Republican administration, George W. Bush, Council on Foreign Relations. Yeah, but then we get Obama, right? So surely we get a change. No, look at his early administration, all Council on Foreign Relations. The pup hand puppet exchange with the puppet masters remain the same. Are we a zombie nation? Yes, we are. So we better start figuring out what we're going to do about this, and I think I would be remiss in telling you all of this bad stuff without at least offering you uh, some information on, okay, what are we going to do about all this, all right? Well, here's what we do. First, we've got to either audit or abolish the Federal Reserve System. <laughs> December. So you need to start pressuring your lawmakers now to not renew the charter. We don't even have to do away with anything. We don't have to change any laws. All we have to do is just not recharge them. When, when, did we, when did we get off onto this? This is my original Social Security card. I signed this, I think it was about 18 years old. And you notice it clearly states not for identification. But it is now, and it's happened in my lifetime. When I went in the Army about 1969, I had an RA number, which stands for Regular Army. RA, you get this number. 
I had just barely gotten that memorized when all of a sudden they shift over and said, no, your social security number is now your military number. And now that's the number we all have. And now that number is your computer number and it will follow you for the rest of your life. So we need to get off of some of this computerization. All right, we need to uh, amend or do away with the National Security Act of 1947. Now we know that it uh, separated the Air Force from the Army, created the Air Force, okay. In the public relations move, it changed the War Department to the Defense Department. They, said, they still make war, but now it's defensive war. Uh, and uh, we know that it created the CIA, but what a lot of people don't understand is it also created the National Security Council. Now, if you'll think back, every time we're about to get in some state somewhere, it's the National Security Council that's approved this or okay with this. Can anybody even name me who is the National Security Council? You don't even know, do you? It's four people. It's the President, the Vice President, and the Secretaries of Defense and, um, um, and Foreign Policy. Uh, state. state. Now, wait a minute. Three of those are appointed by the President. So in other words, this little known section of this National Security Act 1947 is what has created a modern national security state headed by one person, President of the United States. That's a dictatorship any way you want to look at it. If you think Franklin Roosevelt tried to gather the dictatorial powers, it's nothing like what we have now. We need to see that there are no intelligence. If you served in intelligence, you'd be given a nice pension and a nice medal, but you should not be able to run for political office because their whole life, their whole profession has been spent in deceit and doing dirty work, okay? So thank you for serving the country. I was in military intelligence myself, and so I certainly understand the need for some secrets, but it's gotten way out of hand. Uh, lobbyists, okay? Number one, lobbyists should be prescribed for visiting congressmen except only certain prescribed hours. And there needs to be lobbyists for the people. In other words, when a lobbyist from Monsanto goes in to see your senator, uh, there should be a lobbyist that goes in with him to counteract some of his statements and to question what he said. with all these fact-finding junkets and all this way that they spend tax money and, and the lobbyists get to them. Uh, we need to start setting term limits on even right up to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Yeah. Now, to curtail all that corruption, professional politicians, senators should be limited to three terms, representatives to no more than six. You know, the original idea was you serve uh, in Congress, okay? If you run around stumped, talk to your friends and neighbors, they elected to Congress, you went up there, served a few years, then you came back. You went back to actually learning and living. So where did we get to this point now where this is a lifetime profession and your primary duty is to get reelected? The problem is, is that for all of these things we just mentioned, it's going to require a vote of Congress. And the odds are well enough none. These people, here we are in the worst economic depression in this country, actually worse than the Great Depression. There's been more bank failures than during the 30s. Okay, businesses, jobs, unemployment, unemployment figures are jimmied with. If you go on unemployment, you go past a year or so, they take you off the unemployment rolls because they just say you're unemployed. So all of a sudden, you don't count anymore. So it's about double or triple what they say it is. And then in spite of this, Congress keeps giving themselves raises. Good God. All right, there is a solution. Vote them all out. All of them. All right? And I've heard it for years. I heard it with Lyndon Johnson even when he was a senator. So, yeah, he's a crook, but he's our crook. And this is what happens all across America. Everybody I talk to traveling all across the country, they say, yeah, get rid of Congress. Oh, we accept our guy. Because we got a new fire truck. Uh, we got a new highway over there, you know. I mean, our guy's doing okay. 
Well, everybody goes down, goes for their guy, and we're right back where we started from. In fact, I think it was Albert Einstein who said that the definition of stupidity is, is doing the same experiment over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, we keep voting. Hmm? So we keep voting for the same jerks to go back to Washington and then don't understand why nothing changes. Vote them all out. Even, even Ron Paul says, I wouldn't mind being voted out, you know, if it means straightening the thing up. So if they're on the level and they really mean well, they're not going to mind sitting out a term or two, and then they come back and run again, okay? And when, when somebody does run, don't listen to anything they say, because uh, I guarantee you the way you can tell for sure if a politician is lying to you is watch his mouth. If it's moving, he's lying. Okay. And I say that not in any kind of uh, accusatory or judgmental way. They have to. If some politician got up and told you the truth, you'd never elected. Nobody get elected. All right. So they got to lie. So don't listen to anything they say. Watch what they do. Watch them like a hog. And if they vote the way you think they should be voting, then vote for them again. And if they don't, then vote them out. And you know, folks, that's not a radical idea. It's supposed to work. But it's not. We need to go back and bring patriotism back to the schools. It didn't hurt us to salute the flag. All right? And, and then they take, they take the Ten Commandments out of school and they wonder why there's school shootings. It's nuts. We definitely need education reform. Other school systems around the world operate better than we do. No child left behind. Sounds good on paper, but instead of pushing the lower students up, it pulls the higher students down. This is that type of socialization that I was rapping about. I say anyone who's a member of a secret society should not hold public office. Okay? Do away with the Patriot Act. Just yeah. you know, this legislation out. And as has been admitted and documented, nobody even read it. And they're still doing this. Chelsea ran all the other day, 666 page bill. They gave it to them that morning and said, we're going to vote on it this afternoon. Hey, I'm a speed reader and I couldn't read 666 pages and at least understand what it said. I tried speed reading more in peace one time. Read it 15 minutes. I think it was about Russia. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do it. No more cover-up commissions. The next time something happens, when that dirty suitcase nuke bomb goes off in North Carolina or, or Colorado or Des Moines, okay, we need to have a commission set up of a cross-section of America. We need to have a few police people, some academics, some students, some just plain people off the street from different sections of the country. Let them sit and look at all the evidence in the open with some kingdom powers and figure out what happened so that we don't have another light at the end of the tunnel of Vietnam or another lousy Warren Commission that met behind closed doors or secret testimony came out and then proclaimed a scenario that did not even jive with their own material in their 26 volumes. We need an oversight committee. And while we're there, not only on special crimes and, and special events and, you know, big tragedies, but just we need them overseeing the FDA, which is now in the pocket of the of Monsanto and the drug companies. We need them overseeing the, the drug FDA. We need them overseeing the DEA. California and Colorado have already legalized medical marijuana. And by the way, I understand Colorado now has seen uh, traffic fatalities drop 47%. Is that because you smoke a little dope, you don't want to get out and drive anything. And if you do, it's <laughs> you're watching what you're doing. I guarantee you, I've seen the studies uh, I drove me on the road with somebody high on pot and somebody drunk on alcohol. 
and I'd rather be on the road with uh, uh, either of those rather than somebody trying to text. <laughs> you see the bumper sticker said, honk if you love Jesus, text if you want to meet him real soon. <laughs> no more cover-up. Oversight. All right. Tenth Amendment. Everything not specifically delegated to the federal government belongs to the state and hence to us, the people. And what are the two obligations of the federal government? There's only two. Point regulate money, provide for the common defense. It's that simple, folks. And provide for the common defense, that shouldn't even be any big deal, okay? We need to keep one division, mobile, mobile infantry that can be airlifted somewhere, some hot spot if we have to, and so then a cadre of electronic technicians that know how to launch missiles and operate satellites and stuff, and that's about the only military we should have. Because the only thing we should be concerned ourselves with is an, is an invasion of the United States. And with nuclear weapons, that's not gonna happen. Because unlike World War II, where they would assemble huge Armadas of ships and landing craft, and then land on the beaches in North Africa and D Day and Okinawa and Saipan and all like that. Soon, today, as soon as you congregate all that massive force, one nuke, boom, they're gone. Okay? It ain't gonna work. Besides that, I don't know how many of you all know this, but right after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese general staff was ecstatic. They said, We pretty well knocked out their Pacific fleet. Let's go and invade the west coast of America. And I believe it was Admiral Yamamoto, one of the architects of the Pearl Harbor uh, raid, uh, who cautioned, no, we don't want to do that. He said, uh, the Americans are too well armed. They, there would be a gun behind every blade of grass. And he's right. There are, there are at least as many guns in this country as there are people. And if somebody landed at, at, at uh, Corpus Christi or Galveston or landed on the east coast or west coast, I guarantee you we'd all be down there with our shotguns and rifles and everything else. That ain't gonna happen, folks. So why do we have this huge military? Because of, they are the security force of the corporations. And that's why we are fighting in all these places across the country. Posse comitatus. Anybody know what that means? All right. At the end of the Civil War, actually about 1879, because of Reconstruction, the people not only in the South but in the North realized what a hassle, what a pain there was, how much corruption there was in a military police state. So they passed the Posse Comitatus Act, which states the U.S. military cannot be used to police the civilian population of the United States. Now that sounds strange to you because they're doing it anyway. And the way they're getting by, at first they got by with it at Waco, and in the way of 9-11 by just sending troops in. And everybody was so thankful that maybe they're protecting against the terrorists, they didn't say anything. All right? But then Cooper heads began to say, hey, you're violating policy commentators. So what are they doing now? What they're doing now is instead of occupying this country with military troops, they're militarizing the police forces. And Homeland Security is using your tax money to send them armored cars, tanks, all kinds of stuff. And the police, that's fine with them. They get a lot of money, a lot of good, neat toys to play with. Years ago, when I'm working for the Star Telegram over Fort Worth, the Fort Worth Police approached the city council and wanted uh, some funding so they could buy a flamethrower. <laughs> I went to one of the chiefs and I said, well, where do you need a flamethrower? Throw for it. That's the guy he said, proud to go. <laughs> That's the mentality, folks. It's up to us to put a stop to this, okay? Think about it. it used to be serve and protect. And now they got helmets and Kevlar and that machine guns and tanks, okay? Did you ever wonder about on, on these highways leading in and out of Dallas? used to be four lane divided with a nice little grassy medium strip, you know, and then the next thing you know, they put in a little strip of concrete. Yeah. I'm thinking, oh, this is cool, they got a bicycle path, and then, oh, and then they come in and put those steel posts with steel cable. Either that or those concrete dividers. What's with that? 
We're broke. We don't have money to be putting all that on all the highways. Why are they doing that? Has, has anyone noticed that we have a huge problem with people making U-turns out on the freeway? No. Those are there so when they lock down the city and you're approaching that police checkpoint, you can't turn around and go back. They want to shut everything down and every city is going to become a FEMA camp. We've already talked about the, the dope. Let me tell you something, we're very close now to having legalized marijuana. How do I know that? Because the U.S. government has now got the patent on medical marijuana. They got a patent on it, but you can't have it. Now, here's the catch-22. The researchers go to the uh, DPA and say, we want to study the medical benefits of pot. And the DPA says, no, you can't do that because it's classified as a class A, class A narcotic. So you can't get a license to study it. Okay? Well, then they say, well, let's reduce it from a class A to a class B and a little less because nobody's ever died from an overdose of pot. And the DPA says, no, we can't reduce it because there's not enough medical uh, experimentation and evidence. Can you spell catch 22? This is the kind of crap that we're living under. Nobody even pays attention because they're too busy watching American Idol or whatever. Do away with hate crimes. What do you mean, hate crimes? Come on. There's either crimes or there's not. You can't stop people from hating. What you can stop them from doing is hateful things. Somebody beats somebody, attacks somebody, okay. But to say, oh, well, he said something. Besides that, we, we all know that we shouldn't be using the N-word, right? I mean, that's just a no-no. They say, well, you know, it, 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 it hurts my feelings, and I don't like that, says the minorities, and I didn't understand that, and I'm perfectly well. I say, that's it. I'm going to scratch that from my vocabulary, and, and it, it offends them, and I don't want to offend anybody. I'm never going to say that again. But then I turn on my TV. My, my, my satellite, and here's some black comedian. That's all he ever says. Wait a minute. And then more. And you know, the democracy of it all is just incredible. No. Do away with hate crimes. And we need to stop being the arms merchant of the world. We sell arms and everybody. This this whole thing with Syria. They're not asking the proper question. The proper question is who actually used the gas? And I think it's the, the best evidence it seems to indicate it was the rebels. And they were, yeah. And the next question is, well, where did they get it? They got it from Saudi Arabia, who's supporting the Sunnis. And and then where did Saudi Arabia get it? They don't manufacture chemical warfare and gas. They got it from us. They're old buddies, okay? And then of course you I'm sure you all know about the the uh, the, the uh, ATF thing and the guns, the, the Fast, and Fast, and Fast, and Fast and Furious, yeah, thank you, okay? So, what are we doing? Pharmaceutical reform. <laughs> Speaking of, the, mo the, most, the most abused prescription drug in America is Prozac. The major ingredient in the Prozac is sodium fluoride. Sodium fluoride was not discovered, but the Nazis discovered sodium fluoride. If a little bit is put in the water, it will keep you pacified and dumbed down. So they put it in the water at the concentration camps. Well, don't laugh, because Dallas is putting it in your water. Zombie nation. That's right, zombie everybody out, okay? It's incredible. Now, by the way, the sarin gas that they're claiming that the Assad is used on the Syrians, primary ingredient is sodium fluoride. All right, so now wait a minute. If we're going to start bombing leaders who use sodium fluoride on their own citizens, I guess we're going to have to start with the White House. And we know, we know that uh, we need to stop Codex Amelia, which is, if you don't know about it, study up on it. I won't even go into that. But this is where eventually you're going to have to go to your doctor, pay for a doctor's visit to get a prescription to get some vitamins. And look what they're doing to us. Chemtrails, vaccines, GMO food, the fluoridation of the water. 
You know there's more than 100 microbiologists who all met untimely death. What do they know? Or what are they going to know when the pandemic hits? And here's the three people who can tell us what it is, where it came from, and what we need to do about it. But no, they're all been taken out. We better start waking up. Oh, boy. The Obama health care plan. Holy cow. I want to go to that. Surely you all aware of that. All I'm going to say is it's like, you know, the government took over General Motors. So by telling you that you have to have the Obama's health care plan, and if you don't, you're going to be fine, that's like saying you have to buy a sugar letter. If you don't buy one, we're going to find you. Does that make any sense? Is that American way to do things? Yeah. I, yeah. I, it should be. It should be. Here we go. Kill for peace. Now, we already talked to Iraq, too. You know. Now, here's what kills me is, is that First off, Obama says, well, I'm exerting the executive privilege, and I say we're going to go bomb Iraq, and everybody's going, no, 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 and the polls show anywhere from 65 to 95 percent of the public says no, and uh, finally, I think he kind of got caught up a little bit, particularly because in England, they actually had a vote in, in the House of Commons and said, no, we're not going to do that, even though Tony Blair was pushing it, okay? So Obama then had to take a step back. He said, well, okay, I'm going to ask Congress for a resolution. Well, everybody goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, he's okay. He's asking for a resolution. resolution. But then what did he say? Then he said, if they vote against me, I reserve the right to go ahead and do it anyway. Dictator. That sounds like a dictator to me. My motto is anything that's not voluntary is tyranny. If <laughs> And are we a nation of law or are we a lawless nation? Well, I hate to tell you, we're a lawless nation. We really are. Because what appeal, what is applied to some person on the street is not applied to people in power. The, the financial debacle of 2008, millions of people have lost millions and trillions of dollars. Many have lost their homes. And who has been put on trial? Who's been called on the carpet? Who's been fired? Who's been demoted? Who's gone to jail? Nobody but Bernie Madoff, and that was simply because he was ripping off the ripoff. <laughs> <laughs> so just remember, see, it's not fascism when we do it, but it is. Sometimes I think that we're in a position right now today, we're just in the same position as those Germans in 1938. Right. Everybody's going, see, oh, see, oh, yeah, we're world we're gonna make peace all over the world you know and, and a handful of people are going wait a minute look at these nazis i don't know there's something funny here we, we shouldn't be giving them all this power and they're doing this but oh no no you're just unpatriotic it's all the same deal in fact history just rolls right around look when hitler took over in early 1933 uh you know germany was a republic the Weimar republic had a constitution the whole thing okay Within a, month, within a couple of months, uh, the Reichstag, the Parliament, caught fire. He blamed it on terrorists. Now it turns out the Nazis said it themselves. Okay, and then he ran through the Enabling Act, just like the Patriot Act, and called for gun confiscation and registration, called for uh, detention centers, which quickly evolved into concentration camps, which consolidated the German police constabulatory into what became the Gestapo. Does that sound familiar? Hello, here we are in 911. Okay, Patriot Act, Military Commissions Act, Homeland Security. We're just going through it all over again, and here we are shouting in the wilderness. But you can find out all you need to know from my book, The Terror Conspiracy, or The Trillion Dollar Conspiracy, or Rule by Secrecy is another one I've got that'll tell you what's going on or the trillion dollar conspiracy that was that one. And then I got a brand new one out called Our Occulted History, which will really raise your eyebrows. But folks, what it comes down to is we are in the struggle between light and darkness because throughout history, it's been pretty well established that light is knowledge and darkness is ignorance. We all live in a city here of a couple of million people and most of them are ignorant. Now that doesn't, say, that doesn't mean they're stupid. 
It just means they're ignorant. They don't have any idea of what's going on. So I challenge you to go out today and promise yourself that you're going to talk to at least one other person. If everybody in this room was to tell one other person what you've learned here tonight, and those people go out and tell one other person, pretty soon we could be in the majority. And I'll just wind this up by saying the good news is there's more of us than there are of these people trying to control us. And we're getting smarter all the time. Thank you all. All right. If I can, if I'll be happy to answer anything that I think I can. Yes, sir. I've got two questions. Check. Hold on a minute. We've got a microphone here. There was a doctor that I saw in Malbec. Like, there was a doctor in Malbec that I saw where it talked about the police in New York City on 9 11. Because you were know, showing pictures of a building that had damage, but it wasn't related to the two towers that were, that were hit. Um, there was a report that the police, there was even uh, this one documentary, the police, the police recordings talking about they found vans with explosives, moving vans with explosives in, in New York City. Um, talk about the urban moving systems, talk about possible Saudi um, and Israeli involvement, such as the 9 11 dancing Israelis, the 9 11 art students. They showed up in the building where I worked at Louisville four months before 9 11, the Israeli art students. And so I know there's like a 54 page DEA report on it. You Google DEA, Israeli art students, you'll find it. But just talk about those points. Okay, ago, two things there the Saudis and, and Israel. Um, Okay, number one, the Saudis. The Saudi connection is pretty thick and pretty obvious. Uh, and if you remember, when Congress first put together a coalition investigation of 9-11, they had an 18-page document on the Saudi uh, influence, the Saudi connection, which was classified. They wouldn't even let us see it. And as far as I know, they still haven't publicized that. And the reason for that is quite simple, because of the tight political and social connections between the Saudi wars and the Bush family, which were invited over to Saudi Arabia in summer 2001 uh, as special honored guests. The other thing is, is Israel, yes. Uh, most of you either have forgotten or never knew about the art student scandal. This was in the summer of 2002. 400 Israelis who were over here on student visas, supposedly to study art, uh, were tossed out of this country and sent back to Israel because they had been spying on our military installations and all kinds of stuff here. Now, I ask you, if it turned out that these 400 spies had been Pakistanis or Iraqis or Iranians, just think what our media would have done. But no, these were Israelis, so they just quietly got deported and sent home. What's really weird is not weird, but uh, this kind of ties it in is that many of these Israeli spies were trailing Mohammed Atta and these people that they claim were in charge of 9-11. They were at the same bases, the same restaurants. They would even gone to the same flight school. So wait a minute. Were the Israelis aware of what was going on? Were they aware that we were about to be attacked? I think so. Well, then wait. They either told our leaders or they didn't tell our leaders. Which would it be? I'm thinking they told our leaders at the highest level. And they said, uh huh. And this is the same thing, by the way, as Pearl Harbor. Some of you older folks, we've heard all our life the, the rumor that Roosevelt may have known in advance that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked. But nobody's ever been able to prove that. And in fact, the biggest argument was that if he had known that, if it had come up through channels, someone would have talked. Well, it didn't come up through channels, it came laterally. On November the 26th, according to the head of the German Gestapo, Heinz Mueller, they intercepted a transatlantic telephone call about one in the morning from Winston Churchill to Franklin Roosevelt. He says, Franklin, I'm sorry to disturb you and wake you up, but I have news. And so Roosevelt said, well, I know you wouldn't call it unless it was important. He said, yes, the Japanese fleet has sailed. And Roosevelt says, yes, we know. We think it's heading for the Philippines. He said, no, Franklin, they're heading for Pearl Harbor. Okay, so Roosevelt said, well, this is monstrous, you know. Uh, he said, 
However, as he thinks about it more, he says, however, this would certainly fit in with our plans because he wanted to get America into the war. And America was isolationist. They didn't want to get into the war. So he, then he's going, it would certainly fit our plans if uh, to pay the taxes. And so then um, he says, but wait a minute, if they come and inform me of this, I'm going to have to act. What can I do? And uh, then again thinking to himself, he says, well, I guess if I'm out of town, then, you know, I can't hear things. They keep telling me something if I'm not there. So I went and checked, and sure enough, the days preceding Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt went to uh, Hot Springs, Georgia, where he hung out, and was out of town, out of pocket. So they knew. But that's just one fashion. If you read my book, The Rise of the Fourth Reich, you'll see about three pages worth of documentation showing that Roosevelt and his chief of staff, George Marshall, they knew that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked. They knew when, and uh, they allowed it to happen to further their political goals which was to get an angry and unified America in World War II. I'm not making any judgments here. Maybe that was necessary. I'm sure you could probably make an argument there. I'm simply pointing out that it's happened before. And so on 9-11, I think what we saw was the culmination of a neoconservative plan, which was articulated in September of 2000 with the project for New American Century, which said we need to place more military personnel in the Middle East, gain control over their oil supplies, and uh, knock over the regimes of Saddam Hussein and Syria and Libya, and take control over this oil in the Middle East. And whoever authored that, though, was pretty appreciative. They said, this is going to be a hard sell to the American public unless there is a catalyzing and catastrophic event like a new Pearl Harbor. Well, a year later, they got it. And by the way, when I was mentioning Bush's National Socialism, that is neoconservatism. That's just a cleaned up term for National Socialism. And in the German, the acronym for National Socialism is, of course, Nazi. And this is what we've been operating on. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Neo Kevin Riley is. Oh, yeah. I bet you. Are you familiar with his recent activities? He's promoting a book, and I think it's very, very important and, and quite different. Do you know about it? it what he, he's, his recent activities. I'm sorry, he's what? Do, do you know about his recent activities? Well, I'm not sure what you're... Well, he, he, he wrote a book called Another 19. He's on the radio promoting it, and it's naming names and, and, and almost legalistic evidence. Right. I, th I think that, th I think that uh, we need to pay attention to all that. There needs to be a reinvestigation. It needs to be honest. Well, okay? Because yes, there are names that can be given. This is, this is uh, an acceleration, a, uh, you know, an amplification of what we're doing. This takes to another level. It's, I think it's real significant. I, I agree with you, but now you folks have got to go out and talk to the zombies, okay? They're having trouble enough thinking that there was another tower that came down. So, you know, if you go in there and start saying, all right, Bush this and Cheney that and Rumsfeld here and there, then you're just going to be, you know, you need to start simple. You need to start with Building 7. You need to start with the, you know, stuff they can understand. Now, for you guys tonight, I gave that a whole little deal there and gave you the whole nuts and bolts, and we could even go much deeper. Look at this. There's 600 pages or whatever, and, and uh, oh, I'm not even there. Uh, that much of this book is footnotes, okay? So this is not theory. Uh, if you get a hold of this book, you'll have all the information you need. I will tell you this, I met a lieutenant colonel who was in Saudi Arabia on 9-11. And uh, they were all watching TV and they saw the planes hit the towers. And they're going, oh, holy crap. And they said, okay, this is war. So they said, they, the base commander immediately called an emergency meeting of all the the staff because they were going to go on a war footing. Everybody showed up right on time except their chief of intelligence and she came dragging in late just quite as a sheep. And this guy said, I was ready to rear the riot act. And I said, don't you understand we're under attack in the war situation? Why are you running late? And she said, she was one of three people that had access to the super secret code machine. 
She said, because I was just overwhelmed, says uh, Cheney has ordered a shoot down of the U.S. American uh, commercial airline. So he said when he got back to the United States, he started hearing the story about Let's Roll. Well, he's going, what's that? And they said, well, you know, and told him the official tale about how the passengers had overcome them and everything. He knew it wasn't right. He knew there was another story. People know this stuff all over the place. People like this guy, this guy. People like Laura Chavez. People everywhere. The problem is you're not going to see this in the mass media because it's all, everything you see in here is controlled by one of five multinational corporations with interlocking ownerships and directorships. A handful of people control everything you see in here. That's why it's so incumbent upon you all to get out there and start talking to people and try to educate people on what's going on or we're just going to lose this country. Any other questions? Yeah, Albert. Uh, it's my understanding, I don't speak Russian, but uh, I have read that homeland security translated into Russian is three words which begin with KGB. <laughs> In addition to that, uh, homeland security is the same term that Hitler used, Heimat Sikahai. I mean, it sounds like it's the same people over and over again writing right. the same legislation. Have you read my book, Rise of the Fourth Reich? Yes. You'll find it is the same people. I'm not trying to tell you that these people are neo-Nazis because they're not. They're the real old guys. <laughs> At the end of World War II, we defeated the German military. And it was the German Wehrmacht that uh, surrendered their dreams. We didn't defeat the Nazis. There was nobody representing the Nazi party even in on the surrender. We just scattered them, made them move. And they came over here under Project Paperclip. And we rolled them into our military industrial complex. And we, and unfortunately, in picking up their technology, like jet fighters and nuclear weapons and all kinds of things, we also we were picking up their philosophy. And that's why they're turning this launch free republic into a police state under homeland security. Come on. Okay, is that it? Yes. It's the Houston authority that monitors illegal air traffic. Because everybody in here is 50 and up can remember chemtrails are, you don't even have to debate it. It didn't exist. I used to look at the sky when I was a kid all the time, and I never saw trails go from one horizon to the other. I've seen the little trails that fall as the contrail. And, and you can't show me any, any film of, of something before 1990 where you can see chemtrails in the sky. So the question is, who monitors that? Who's the authority that you would call and say, no, we've seen it in our own neighborhood. I've seen them go huge altitudes, and they're leaving the trail from the takeoff. There's no condensation at, at the ground level. There's even been videos taken of them in the air, and they cut it off and on. So wait a minute, you're trying to tell me they cut their engines off, off and on, flying across the sky? No. No, they're dumping stuff on. We even know what's in there. And so and fluoride, it's aluminum oxide, uh, barium, all this stuff. I interviewed Dr. Uh, Edward Teller years and years ago. And he's known as the father of the H bomb. He's the guy that says we need to seed the upper atmosphere with, with gold, little uh, flecks of gold to reflect ultraviolet rays to hold down global warming. Well, this is basically what they're doing, except gold would be pretty expensive, so they're using other heavy, good conductive metals like barium and, and uh, aluminum oxide. But what it's doing is it's causing a health problem. You go talk to any doctor, you talk to any pharmacist, you're going to find out that respiratory problems are going through the roof. And that's because we're breathing this crap. Okay, and about two years ago, John Holcomb, uh, Obama's science czar, actually tried to run up a trial balloon. He said, you know, uh, we may have to seed the upper atmosphere with heavy metals and particulates and pollutants to hold down global warming. And I, and uh, of course the environmental people, the health people, just went nuts. They said, you can't do that. It's going to cause a, a real health problem. And so they ran up their trial balloon. They showed there was a lot of public resistance to this. So now they're continuing to do it, but they don't tell you about it. 
I heard I heard on uh, Channel 8, by the way, about five or six years ago, about five o'clock on their early news show, the weather guy said for you folks who were calling in asking about those crisscrossing trails in the sky, said I just wanted to tell you, you know, I have nothing to worry about. The Air Force informs us that they are uh, uh, providing a shield to reflect ultraviolet rays. Okay? And then I, went, I, I just caught snacks as I went, holy cow, so I got ready to record that on the 10 o'clock news and it was never on. It was never on again. They, they, they're just lying to you, right down the line. And uh, even, even the Osama bin Laden assassination didn't happen. He's been dead since 2001. Buto tried to tell us that and then she's assassinated. You know who else told us that? Madeline Albright, a former Secretary of State. But well, wait a minute, what about SEAL Team 6? Did they go into Abbott Bob and, and take him out and do all that heroic stuff? Yeah, they did. But one of their helicopters got shot down. Okay? And then, here's the clincher, the guys that were involved in that way, they all died in helicopter crash. Yeah. Over in Afghanistan. You know, I can believe how they do. You know, and here's another thing. If you'll read their accounts, yeah, they went in, yeah, they were propelled out of the helicopter, yeah, they went in and shot up the place, and yeah, they shot some guy coming out of the thing, and then they were told that they were going after his own good line. And they were told that, hey, good for you, you got him. But how do we know they got him? Was there an autopsy? No, he threw his body in the sea, said the honor Muslim tradition. Yeah. <laughs> These guys grow in the desert, they don't want to be buried in sea. No, I mean, this is, how, this is how flaky this whole thing is. And besides that, they didn't have to, why didn't they shoot him in the kneecap and bring him back over here and then heal him up and put him on trial, prove to the world that he did it and that we've caught him and that there's going to be prosecution and punishment for people who attack the United States. No, they can do that. They kill him and dump the body. That's mafioso style. Yes? Um, I've got a question and there's one coming up from the side here, but in follow-up to his question about who's the authority that, uh, in charge of air traffic, well, that would be NORAD. And well, what are the, the FAA for the civilian craft. True, but, but for you know illegal aircraft coming over the NORAD. In NORAD, and which my first thought when I was sitting there in front of the boot tube on 9-11 was, where the heck is NORAD, and why weren't the jets, jets scrambled immediately? Right. Has anybody stopped to consider that the Pentagon is the most protected building in the world? And uh, I happen to know for a fact that they've got automated anti-missile batteries all around the Pentagon. If you're flying towards Washington, there are no fly zones, okay? And if you penetrate one of those no-fly zones and you don't have a friendly transponder signal, those missile batteries will automatically open launch on you, okay? Why didn't they go off? Come on, folks. That's not rocket science. That's just thinking clearly. Albert? Uh, well, let's follow up with history. Yeah, right here. History repeats itself, you say. During Hitler's regime and the Nazi control, um, how many people had the option of being radiated or sexually assaulted to travel? Things were a lot worse than they were then. I think so. And you know why I agree with him? It's because the Gestapo at the height of their power. And yes, if they got hold of you and dragged you down to one of their dungeons, they'd probably perform unspeakable acts on you. But even the Gestapo at the height of their power did not dare stop German civilians in public places and throw them. Okay? They just didn't dare do that because the Germans would not have put up with that. But we do. We're idiots. We're just fluorided out. I don't know. I'm thinking, see, I've been out in Wise County for 35 years on my own little well. Maybe, maybe that's why I'm still thinking. <laughs> well, uh, first off, to apologize first off, because I just got here, and I want to make sure I'm not asking a question that's been covered. That's right. right. Just right. right on. But um, I, I got active in 911 Truth like 2003. My dad was a block away from Pentagon when he got hit, kind of his personal thing, even though he sits on the other side of that. I've been following the trail all the way up against it. And of the last couple of years, there's only been a couple tidbits of the information that seems to have been popular.
stomped out, that it may be paused for a little bit, because there's been a lot of e fighting being in space beams and the no plane theory or all that type of stuff. And I kind of, for many years, accepted the idea that 9-11 truth was a movement that wasn't represented by what happened, but more so by what we knew didn't happen, I guess if that makes any sense. But then I ran across a guy named uh, Dimitri Kalesov about a year ago. Are you familiar? All right, this might be, this might be nothing then, okay, because I was going to ask if it was covered. But uh, Dimitri Kalesov, mm -hmm. if I remember right, is an uh, ex -Bets and And um, he uh, speculated beyond the um, thermite theories, or the thermate theories, um, to the other existing conditions that were never really explained by those things being um, yeah, thermite can cut that, right? And it can knock those buildings like it did. But it can't really explain the molten pools that are sitting in the bottom there, right? That seems like it would need a small thermonuclear device. Uh, or the disintegration of the, of the steel curve. Yeah. Right, right. So uh, for days, it was like that afterwards. And he had provided a theory, and since this might be new information to some people here, um, Back when they were building a lot of the major metropolitan areas, um, in a part of the code for them erecting a structure, they also had to provide a contingency plan on how to bring that very same structure down without destroying any other structures around. It was just part of the way it was done. And at the time when that building was built, uh, nuclear uh, energy and using that as a destructive device wasn't as a taboo of a topic and everything. And he had provided um, the plans that uh, showed that that was part of the plan on how they had thought to bring the building down in on itself. It also provides some pretty information, uh, interesting information on um, exactly the missile that shot the Pentagon and everything like that. So um, I was wondering if that thing touched or if you had any information on it. For the last two years, I've been stalled at that and haven't really heard anybody that's been in the higher echelon of the 9 11 truth circle speculate on it. So well, the, pro the problem is when you start speculating, then you open yourself up to all kinds of contra contradictory information and <laughs> argument and everything else. But you're absolutely right. And here's the thing. If you use exotic technology, not generally known to the public, then you can come up with any cover story you want to, and no one can really adequately rebut you. And what am I talking about? There was a lot of exotic technology used. Therm thermite, which is the nanotechnology thermite, okay? Uh, mini nukes. Uh, some of you older guys here. Am I the only one who remembers back in the 50s when they were shooting uh, atomic artillery shells? Remember the big long time gun or whatever it was? And they, I've seen the news reels, they fired the cannon and it goes off and it sets off a nuke. Okay, that was an artillery shell. What about this big? And that was in the 50s. So today, they got atomic weapons that are about the size of a baseball or a small basketball, okay? And if you put one of those in the basement as a shaped charge and shape the explosive to go up that center core and it would knock out those cores, then you use thermite. And that's another thing. Everybody always argues over, oh, it was a disintegrated beam. Oh, it was a nuke. No, it was a, it was a uh, thermite. You know, well, hey, how about all of them? Yep. You know, you use a little bit of all of that, okay? And then, because people are not aware of that, same thing with Global Hawk, people at that time were not aware that you could capture an airliner uh, with, uh, with computer control. But the head of British Airways in early 2001 publicly stated that the days of hijacking were over, that they could now capture the onboard computer override it and land the plane safely regardless of whether the flight crew or the hijackers wanted it. And I was aware of that. And so on 9-11, I went, well, I didn't get along with Blowhawk, but nobody else knew about that. It was years. Today, you go to movies and they'll advertise for the Air Force and, hey, come join the Air Force. You can sit at a console at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, and you can bomb a village in Afghanistan with one of these drones, okay? We now know we have that technology, but we didn't know then. And back then, we did not have the technology to use a cell phone call from a high-flying airline. That was not until 2003 when they finally came up with a chip and made a big deal about it. Hey, we've got a chip now that allow you to make a phone call. Okay? And yet, well, we forget about all this stuff. you got to go back and put it all into context. 
And uh, yeah, so there's a lot of exotic technology that was being used. Okay, we done? No. One more. A lot of us are concerned with what's going on right now with Syria, and those of us at a certain age uh, you know, recall the Cuban Missile Crisis. And me personally and a number of other people I've talked to, what we're going through right now, right this minute, and you know, yesterday, today, tomorrow, it has that feel of kind of this doomsday thing. Um, you know, a lot of us read, you know, from various websites and and there are some pretty credible people out there, people we consider credible, who think that the ultimate goal of this is World War III. In fact, uh, supposedly the Russian media uh, have been informing the Russian citizens to prepare for a nuclear war. Do you have an opinion about what's going on right Yeah, I do. I think the would-be controllers, the New World Order boys, whatever you want to do, Illuminati, whatever you want to call them, I think they're in a panic mode because we're wise enough and people are beginning to understand what's going on. And they're not able to pull off their little shenanigans like they've been in the past. And I think they see the only way to avoid prosecution and maybe the the guillotine is to start World War III. Just blow and everything it, up. Just blow it all up. All huh? Just blow everything up. Yeah, blow it all up. You know, here, 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 this is wild. Any of y'all remember Tom Lair? <laughs> here we are. Back, this, I think, was a big song in the early 60s. They're rioting in Africa. There's strife in Iran. Boom, 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 boom. And what, may, what nature doesn't do to us da, 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 will be done by our fellow man. The whole world is festering with unhappy souls. The French hate the Germans, the Germans hate the Poles, the Italians hate Yugoslav, South Africans hate the Dutch, and I don't like anybody very much. But we can be tranquil and thankful and proud For man's been endowed with a mushroom-shaped cloud And we know for certain the some lovely day Someone will set the spark off and we will all be blown away <laughs>